pleasure to welcome uh, Philip Saves from UCSF, who is an old friend. We actually did our postdoc together down at Caltech. And uh, he'll describe a whole set of really wonderful new uh, experiments that have come out of his lab, which, in my view, and I think many people's view, represent the uh, future of how we can take signals as we've studied from, say, a prosthetic arm where you may have sensation on it, and get those signals back into the brain. Right? So this is the so-called write-in problem that we've referred to, and he'll be speaking about that. And um, throughout his whole career, he's studied a great deal about how you take multiple types of sensory information, vision, proprioception, and fuse that together. Also very interested in brain-machine interfaces, basic science, and so forth. So. Uh, for those of you that may be considering graduate school in the coming year or two, <laughs> make sure to check out his lab. Thank Thanks, Cliff. Hello. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start by showing you a little video. So, I hope it's a little bright up here, but can you guys see that all right? Let's see if this works. Um, but that's good. That's fine. I don't want people to go to sleep. So, so look at this video. This is a guy in a wheelchair, and it's in slow-mo, obviously, but e even, even aside from that, you can tell that there's something wrong here. All he's trying to do is get out of the wheelchair and sit down on the ground. And uh, I think you'll agree with me that he does not look like he's got full command uh, of things there. He's having some difficulty. Does anybody want to just throw out a guess of what's wrong with this person? Anything? Any ideas? Parkinson's, good guess. Anybody else? Okay, yeah, I mean, it looks like maybe Parkinson's or ALS or something. He clearly is some motor deficit, right? Does everyone agree that's what it looks like? Actually, he doesn't. His motor system is completely fine. There's nothing wrong with his motor system. What there is a problem with is his sense of perception of his own body. So this is somebody who, this is from a, a documentary, uh, I'll tell you about in a second, but this is somebody who has lost proprioception. Oh boy, I have trouble with my uh, animation. All right, well, I was going to define some terms here, but this is somebody who has lost somatic sensation. So he cannot feel his own body. And, that, and when we think about somatic sensation, there are a couple different things we feel about. We think about, we think about the sense of touch, cutaneous touch or tactile touch, like when you brush against something, or when you push against something. But there's also this sense of proprioception which is a generic term that basically means the ability to know where your own body is, the position, state of your own body. And uh, the word that's supposed to be here, but for, somehow didn't make it on the animation, is deafferentation. So do you know what afferent versus efferent? Does that ring a bell? So efferent is, a, is an anatomical term, or a physiological term, to mean outflow. And afferent is a term to mean inflow. And so when we talk about afferent fibers or afferent pathways, what we're usually talking about are sensory pathways that come into, inflow into the brain. And so this is somebody we say he's deafferented because he's lost that somatosensory inflow, that ability to feel his own body. And in particular, for this particular demonstration, the problem is that he's lost his sense of proprioception. He cannot feel where his body is. And it turns out that sensory deficit has truly profound implications for the ability to move. So it's not just sensory, now it becomes a movement problem. And I, I highly recommend this uh, BBC documentary. Um, I don't know if, I tried to find it through some legitimate source and couldn't, but um, it is available on YouTube and the whole thing. And it, it's really actually a great story because it's not so much about this guy who would be a typical patient in this sort of case. There aren't many of these people, but it's actually about a guy who through sheer force of will manages to retrain himself to move without proprioception. It's quite a good uh, watch actually. But normally, for normal people, if you lose your sense of, uh, of ability to feel where your body is, your sense of proprioception, the, the consequences are quite bad. So I'm going to talk a little bit now just generally about proprioception and its role in movement control. So um, Claude Gaz at, at uh, Columbia and uh, a number of his colleagues uh, did some kind of seminal studies in the 90s where they looked at patients that had something called large sensory fiber neuropathy. So these are patients who, again, these sensory fibers, these afferent fibers were lost. And, um, they had them do very simple things like just mimic like a sawing motion or cutting. And normal 
subjects can do that quite well, of course. And if you just look at the path that they take, it's a nice straight path. But if you have these deafferented patients, what happens is that you get these kind of wiggly, jiggly paths. So they're not able to properly coordinate and properly time their movements. And this is when they, they have vision, they can see their hand, um, but they're, they're still not very good. And if you take away vision, they're even worse. Okay, so um, clearly there's something about that sense of proprioception that's critical to get uh, effective, well-calibrated movement. And um, it's actually not that hard to come up with laboratory tasks where deafferented patients do okay. I mean, they can do this task. It's just a little wiggly jiggly. Um, but a quote from Rothwell about a patient that was deafferented where he says, you know, he's okay at these laboratory tasks, but his hands are relatively useless to him in daily life. He's unable to grasp a pen, to write, to fashion his shirt buttons, or to hold a cup in one hand. So this is a pretty profound deficit when it comes to the ability to get around in the world. And um, a lot of that isn't just the sense of proprioception. It's also the tactile sense from the fingers, which is critical to do things like manipulate objects. And just to give you a sense for this, um, I've got what I think these are some of the greatest videos in all of neuroscience. I love these videos. Um, this is Roland Johansson. I don't even know if they've ever been published, but Roland Johansson uh, graciously gave them to Randy Flanagan at Queens, who, with permission, gave them to me. And uh, the, 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 so let me show you what, what, he, what Roland did. So he asked this woman, this is a normal, healthy woman, to do something very simple. Okay, so her task is going to be to pick up a match and strike it on this box and light the match. That's pretty straightforward, right? You could all do that pretty quickly with one hand. It took her 7.5 seconds to do that. Pretty easy. Now what he did, oh, sorry. Now what he did was he took some lidocaine, which is a drug that's a nerve block. It's like the thing you get in your teeth when you go to get a, a cavity fixed or something like that. And he injected lidocaine into the fingertips of this woman's hands. And look what happens now. She can't, I mean, this is pretty, pretty bad. She can't even manage to pick up a match. And again, it's not a motor problem. She can see what she's doing. She can move her fingers fine. But she just can't quite manage to get things coordinated. And you notice, it's even like her hands look like they're just not moving right. Everything looks wrong. And so when you think about the ability to move in an efficient and coordinated manner, you have to keep in mind that that's part of a closed loop process. And the sensory basis of that is, is just as important as the motor basis. It's a loop. Now again, this is with tactile feedback. Proprioceptive feedback is also important. Now I'm going to show you a video, which is one that you might, may have seen. I decided not to use one of Krishna's videos because um, you know, I don't want to pick on Krishna. But this is from, uh, uh, from Jen Collinger and, uh, and others uh, at University of Pittsburgh. And I don't know if you guys have seen this before or not, but this is a video of a, um, of a patient with spinocerebellar ataxia uh, who has a uh, cortical, motor cortical implant and she is controlling that robotic limb. Have you guys seen this video before? Okay. This is, I think, one of, the, one of the nicest demonstrations of human BMI control of an external robotic device. Okay. That's pretty good. She was able to pick that thing up and pour that. I mean, you know, when I show this to lay audiences, a lot of, you know, people clap sometimes when they see that. Okay. But, so it is impressive. But the thing is, it doesn't look like natural movement. It's slow. It's halting. It just doesn't look quite right. And the question is why? What's missing? And I would argue that at least some of what's missing is the ability to feel your own body. That when you are interacting with a robot like that, you are essentially a deafferented patient. The control side is there, admittedly impoverished, but it's there, but that sensory side is missing. And there's some little bit of hint in the literature that if we could provide somatosensory feedback in a particular proprioception to a user of a BMI interface like that, that performance would improve. So this is a kind of a clever study um, by Aaron Siminski in uh, Nico Hatsopoulos' lab at University of Chicago, where he, um, he had a, a monkey do, this is kind of a typical BMI kind of thing, the things that I think you've probably seen um, videos or heard uh, uh, Krishna talk about. So this monkey is simply trying to do, uh, move a cursor around a screen. 
So this is the kind of performance that he gets when he has the monkey literally move his hand around the screen to hit these targets. And he's doing it in something that, that, that is called a kin arm, but basically it's just a, an overpriced uh, exoskeleton that, uh, with two degrees of freedom that you can buy for laboratory research. So it's got two little um, things that you rest your arm in, and you can move around, and, it, and you can move it passively, and then it just acts like position encoders, um, or you can move it actively because it has, it has uh, motors on it. Okay? So this is a little device you can use to move someone's or a monkey's arm around in the plane. So he had the monkey doing that very simple, uh, straightforward sort of thing, and the monkey's pretty good at it. And then he does it with BMI control. And it's a little hard to see here, but I'll show you some quantitative data in a moment. These trajectories aren't as smooth. It's, the monkey can do it with you know, motor cortical activity being recorded, decoded, moving the cursor around the screen. He can do it, but it's hard. And now what he did is he did something sort of clever. Instead of just using visual feedback, which is normally what you do in BMI control, he had, not only was the monkey controlling the cursor, but the monkey was controlling the movement of his own limb through that, that exoskeleton device. So as the monkey's moving the cursor, his limb is passively being moved along with the cursor. And what happened is that performance improves. This is not active movement. The, the robot is not being moved by the monkey choosing to move it, but it's being moved uh, up on its own, and the monkey is passively going along with it. And when they quantified performance, this is what you get um, with natural movements. This is what you get, uh, this is path length. So this is sort of the, 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 the integrated path length to get from here to here is much bigger during BMI because there's more wiggles and jiggles. But when you provide that somatosensory feedback, performance goes back to zero. Now, you know, th there, there are some issues with the study, most notably, um, this isn't really a recipe to providing artificial somatosensation from an external device because presumably the problem is that the limb is not functioning, and uh, it, you know, if you had an exoskeleton that could move the limb around, then that would be great. And, and actually, I mean, to be fair, there are lots of spinal um, cord injury patients who are motorically deeply impaired but have residual proprioception. And for them, if you had an exoskeletal device or functional electrical stimulation of the muscles that could move their limb around, they might benefit it implicitly, even if they do anything, they would benefit from this kind of, of thing. But if you're thinking about cases like ALS or spinal cord injury or other deficits where um, there is no residual somatic sensation or where you're controlling an external device like that robotic limb from Pittsburgh moving something or controlling the cursor on a screen, then of course there, this won't help. So you need some other way to provide somatic sensory feedback. So how, how would that work? How could you provide somatic sensory feedback in the context of a real BMI? Well, you, the goal here is to replicate, in some sense, the natural ability to feel your body. And I used the word afferent before. That means that there's signals coming up nerves, up to your brain, right? So presumably then what you want to do is you want to go to your brain and put some signal in. And actually, this might be a good time to stop and say, because that was sort of the first transition, that I have a tendency to talk very quickly. And I'm a little tired right now. And the more tired I get, the more manic I get. And the more manic I get, the faster I talk. But that does not mean that this is meant to be an onslaught of information. So I would appreciate, I encourage you, I would be happy if you guys stop me and ask any questions along the way. So I'm about to transition to talking about how one could implement this uh, through stimulation of the brain. But are there any questions so far about proprioception? Yes? Great question. How would you do it? Uh, have the motor spike back. <laughs> yeah, and if you could do that. But the problem with that is, if you, you could do that, that's right. But then there are all kinds of issues, because then there's this whole confound now, because they're, they're, they are moving, and they're actively moving. And it gets very, that's, that's not a great experimental design if, you, if they're fighting back the whole time. So you want something clean. You want to make it where they're really not fighting back. So the first answer is, of course, you train them not to fight back. And, and monkeys are pretty amenable to this sort of thing. If I asked you not to fight back, you would learn. At first, actually, you probably would fight back. Your arm being passively moved around sort of generates um, kind of uh, um, spinal reflex loops that you can't, that it takes time to learn to sort of relax and let it, let it go. But you would be able to do that, and the monkeys can too. But how would you verify that that's, that's what's going on? Anyone know? Do they know about this? Can you uh, record EMG? Excellent. They do know about this. <laughs> yes, EMG, exactly. Do you, have you guys learned about EMG? Electromyogram? So 
um, when, when, the, when the efferent, remember, okay, efferent signals go from the spinal cord to the muscles, uh, it's, it's neural communication like everything else. So you get these, these nerves go to the muscles and they have they action potentials, and then the muscles have action potentials. And you can, re that's electrical activity, lots of electrical activity, coordinated, lots of electro electro electrical activity. So if you just put um, some uh, um, electrodes, say a pair of electrodes right here on my biceps, and I go like this, you would hear from the noise, the electrical noise of the contraction of the muscle. And that is called electromyogram, EMG. Um, there are lots of E blank Gs. So you've heard of EKG, which is heart, because K is cardio in German, right? Or ECG, as they also sometimes call it. That's recording electrograms from your heart. There's EEG, encephalo, the brain. That's those crazy caps that you put on people that nowadays you see people flying robots with and other weird things. Um, I'm sure they're, oh, EOG, you can, you can record uh, eye movements by recording the, the nerve, the volley of, of activity. That, that's basically EMG of the, of the eye, basically. Um, ENG, nystagmus, uh, nystagmus, recording um, involuntary eye movements for people who have uh, Meniere's disease or for otherwise um, are dizzy. Anyway, EMG is one of these things. And so you can record from just peripherally, non-invasively, you could do this uh, at home with probably, I'm sure with an iPhone, uh, a, a, a couple of uh, pieces of electronics and a, uh, 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 and a couple of pieces of metal. You could rig this up yourself. It's actually a pretty big signal. Yep. Can I speak in a question? Yep. So, uh, one quick clarification. The class has definitely seen the Collinger at all video, but in the context of the 60 minutes piece, and not exactly that video. Right. So you missed their job dropping at the wonderful result. <laughs> Got it, okay. Uh, on this last experiment, I, I know Nico's reply. I'm curious what yours is. Uh, of course you do better, potentially, because when you move the arm, you're changing the posture. There are postural signals. You're boosting the SNR. Of course you can decode it better. You mean in motor cortex? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, look. So you don't have a duck, apples to apples. So the question, this gets at a deeper question, which I think is a really interesting one, which is um, if, if what you're doing basically is you're providing the right signal to motor cortex, but it's a sensory signal to motor cortex, and then you're just decoding that sensory signal, and that's sort of boosting the signal, um, then that seems like it's cheating. On the other hand, that's what happens in natural physiology. That's what you call a feedback loop. And so it's, it's suggestive that if you could set up the right feedback loops, you'd be in good shape. And the question is, how? Now, if you just start throwing information in, it's not going to be just the right information that's going to drive the right response in motor cortex. And so I, I think you're exactly right um, that it may, this may be essentially that you're reading out the sensory information in motor cortex. So one thing about neuroscience, you should understand right off the bat, is almost anything anybody tells you, it's wrong. Okay? It's, it's, it, I think it's, uh, nothing that Krishna has told you is true, I'm sure about that. And, 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 and there's, uh, there you go. I mean, there's just nothing that's true. And so here's an example. Somatosensory cortex receives um, sensory information, period, that's what it does. And motor cortex provides motor commands down the spinal cord to move muscles. Period, that's what it does. The problem is that actually there are projections from somatosensory cortex down the spinal cord. What a pain in the ass. And it turns out there are sensory signals that go to motor cortex. Nothing is true. Everything is a mess, okay? Now, of course, it, it's a question of degrees. Motor cortex is much more involved in, dri in driving muscles and in send sending efferent signals. And somatosensory cortex is much more involved in getting efferent signals. But the boundary is not as clear as it seems. Um, actually, I was in the neurosurgery with, uh, I, was, I, was, I was watching a neurosurgery that a colleague of mine, Eddie Chang, was doing. And um, he called me over at one point. I'm like, ah, there's a human subject on the table. And the brain's open. And he says, come on, come here, flip. And I go over and he says, where's central sulcus? <laughs> and I, <laughs> and uh, I, I hesitated. And I was like, uh, uh, and he's like, exactly. The, and the reason why, I, I think I have a picture later, but have you guys seen a, a, a lateral view of a monkey brain? 
at any point during this? Okay, you know, it's, it's fairly, if you can't find central sulcus on a, on a picture of a lateral view of a monkey brain, then you just, no one showed you yet. Because once, once someone showed you, it's pretty easy to find. But, but not true in a human, it's very complicated. And in fact, the boundary between, between somatosensory and motor is, is a little bit fluid in the human brain. And that's, that's true in the monkey brain as well. But, um, it's just that a lot of that's buried in, inside that central sulcus, so it's hard to find. Good enough? All right. So, uh, let's see here. Um, so, what, so how can we provide artificial feedback? So, you know, we have a little bit of a guidepost on how to do this. Um, I know that EJ uh, talked to you earlier last week sometime about retinal prostheses, but here's another example, the cochlear implant. So this is an example uh, where, uh, th by the way, I, you guys probably know this already, but this is something, this is like, this works. There are, there, there are tens, hundreds of thousands of people wearing cochlear implants, it totally works. People here, it's great. And what they do, right, is they put some electrodes into the cochlea, the, the, in the inner ear. And the cochlea has this wonderful property, a little bit like how the, the, the eye is a camera. In other words, different parts of the eye represent different parts of the visual field. Different parts of the cochlea represent different tones. And that's a beautiful thing, because what that means is that it is possible to do what I call biomimetic, many people call biomimetic stimulation. It's possible to recreate patterns of activity in the cochlea that look a little bit like the normal patterns of activity in the cochlea. And that's possible because of the topographic organization of the cochlea. The cochlea, as I just showed you, is organized by tone. Different parts of it respond to different frequencies of tone. And that means that you can stick an electrode in there and stimulate it different parts of the cochlea. And you know what the percept's going to be, vaguely at least. It's going to sound like some tone in that range. And so, the ability to get a nice topographic organization means that when you stimulate local neurons, they are vaguely all doing the same thing, and they should give rise to, therefore, vaguely biomimetic patterns of activation, which hopefully will give rise to naturalistic perceptions. That's the idea. And it's a great thing that, 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 that you know, biology has set out for us these um, nice kind of breadboards with organization so we can go in and poke at them. Um, can we use that for artificial proprioception? Well, maybe. So let's, let's look at what's out there. So before we get to proprioception, let's think just generally about somatosensory feedback. And uh, as I just told you, oh, here we go. I knew I had it there somewhere. This is the central sulcus, normally not uh, covered by colored bits. Um, this is motor cortex on the anterior side in the front. This is somatosensory cortex on the posterior side in the back. Again, a lateral view of the monkey brain. So, you know, his eyes are over here. This is the back of his head. And uh, if you go and you look at what's going on here in somatosensory cortex, you get what, this is what you learn in the textbooks. Everybody knows about this. You've probably seen pictures of it. The somatosensory homunculus. Okay, and what that means is that if you go and you start poking electrodes in and you stimulate, like Roger Penfield did and others have done, you know, years ago during human neurosurgery, you say, well, where do you feel that? And you, you know, make a little tick mark on a piece of paper. Where do you feel that? What you find out is that certain parts of the body, like the mouth and the hands, are, have very large representations. And other parts of the body, like, where is it in here somewhere? The trunk uh, is kind of in here, uh, has relatively less representation. So there seems to be representation for things that, that are maybe more important from um, our ability to manipulate things and from a control perspective, that a very high representation. And this suggests that it would be fairly straightforward to recreate natural biomimetic patterns of stimulation because there's a nice topography, as I just told you. All right. So this is good. Does it work? Well, yeah, it kind of does, actually. So here's, a, here's an experiment. A number of people have done things like this. This is an experiment from, um, he, he just pokes the monkey, not sharp, just, you know, little indentations in the skin, like I just took a little maybe pen tip and, and poked your hand a little bit. Uh, and then he can record, when he pokes different parts of the hand, what happens in cortex. And so what he does is he's got a couple different arrays of electrodes. Uh, you guys have learned about brain gate and the Utah array. So that's what this is. So they're good for humans, they're good for monkeys. Here's a, a Utah array in a monkey, and next to it is another kind of array that's a little bit smaller. So he's got two different arrays sitting here um, along the posterior bank of, some, of the central sulcus, in other words, in somatosensory cortex. And he's recording what happens when you poke the monkey's hand. And you know, when you poke here, these neurons here light up, and when you poke here, these neurons light up, and when you poke here, these neurons light up. Hey, look, it works, there's topography, right? The colors are segregated here, they're segregated here, at least to some extent. And that suggests 
that you could turn that around now, stimulate through these electrodes, and create biomimetic patterns of activation, and the monkey will feel it. And it turns out it really does work. So he's stimulating, and he can do two things. He can push the skin, that's what this is supposed to be, and he can stimulate in the brain. And he can compare those. So one of the great things about working with monkeys is you can train them to do all kinds of things. And in particular, you can train them to report what they feel. Of course, they can't tell you what they feel, but there are lots of clever tricks. For example, you can ask them to feel two things and you know, lift a bar if the second one is stronger than the first one. Or you can ask them to do two things and lift the finger that they felt pressed, or whatever. There are all kinds of little tricks, and monkeys are amenable to that kind of training. So there are lots of ways. You know, it's not as simple as saying, what'd you feel, monk? But there are ways with a little bit of effort to get your monkey to tell you what he feels. And that's what uh, Sleeman did. And so he's able to show that monkeys can detect stims the stimulation um, on a finger. And not only that, that they can discrim discriminate their amplitude. And he can do experiments where he compares natural, real stimulation to stimulation in the brain. And he finds out that they sort of follow similar patterns. So then you can get a mapping between the intensity of the stimulation, say the rate of, the, of these pulses, um, or, the, or, the, or the amplitude, the amount of current per pulse. Um, and you can compare that to perception, and there's a nice uh, uh, monotonic relationship. So it looks like you can recreate sort of different degrees of touch. And you can also do this with different fingertips. So you can ask monkeys, did you feel you know, this finger, or this finger, or this finger, or this finger? And when the fingers are close together, um, the performance isn't as good, but it's almost as good um, when comparing natural and stim than it is when comparing natural and natural. Yep. So you said that the, they can detect amplitude in terms of current per, per spike. I was sort of under the impression that all spikes are the same. Ah, um, so remember, let me back up here. This is not, so, the, so spike can mean two things. And I, I might have said spike, but I meant to say pulse. Okay, so a spike, when I say spike, usually what I mean is an action potential from a neuron, and those are all, those are kind of winner take all. Now, in fact, that's also a lie. If you watch an action potential, it can go up and down a little bit with time due to sort of cellular level uh, plasticity, but forget about that. Yes, they're all exactly the same. They're, they're all or none, okay? Um, this, is not, this is not a recording of an action potential. This is, the electrode here is being stimulated and the way you typically do this is, um, no marker, but the way you typically do this is you use a biphasic pulse. So you do a little bit of a cathodal and then anodal or vice versa stimulation. So you drive some current in and then back out so that there's no net current flow. And um, what that does, that little elect of electrical field drives, because you're creating a, a time bearing electric field, which will then create current through local neurons. But that current itself is exactly what normally drives an action potential. So then it will drive winner take all, always the same action potentials in the nearby neurons. The number of spikes that you get out, those binary events from neurons, will vary both, uh, it seems obvious, but the, the rate at which you pulse, the faster you pulse, you might think the faster neurons will spike nearby when they're being driven by that pulse. And the more the current, probably what's happening there isn't so much that like the next door neuron, next to that electrode, fires more when you increase the current, Probably what's happening is the electric field is now spreading further, and so you're, you're recruiting more neurons into that per set. And in fact, when you press the skin harder, you actually do recruit, m not only will the local receptors fire more, but you'll start to recruit more receptors because you'll indent the skin more, and so it'll, it'll, it'll spread out on the skin. So it sort of makes sense that that would work. Okay. So anyway, so this seems to, uh, to work. This is great. Um, and there are other examples, by the way. I just want to, I haven't really talked yet. I've talked about brains all so far. But you, know, you, you might think, what about an amputee? Maybe, you know, why mess with the brain? You could also go right to the peripheral nerve, which is that afferent fiber that I talked about. And this is some beautiful work from Dustin Tyler's lab. I'm not going to go into details about it, but they put little cuffs around the residual nerves in an amputee, and they stimulate those. And similarly, they can get, you know, when I stimulate here in this nerve, I get these three different electrodes give me three different spots when I stimulate the radial nerve or the medium nerve or the ulnar nerve. So you can create, again, these sort of tactile percepts on the hand. And um, you know, Dustin has an eye for marketing. Beautiful task he had. Um, he had subjects try to pick the stems out of a cherry. That was the task, with holding the cherry with their prosthetic limb. 
and sometimes they squish the poor cherry, um, and sometimes they don't. They pull it out without squishing the poor cherry. And you can, you can look at how often, how, how many successes they can get without squishing the cherry or dropping it um, when, they have that, when they have that stimulation, that ability to feel their fingertip turned on versus off, and clearly they do much better when it's on. And then you can look at, independent of whether they have vision, that's these two, um, and then you can look at how hard they push when they're trying to do that cherry, and they push really, really hard when the feedback is off because otherwise it'll slip out of their hand, but now that they can feel the pressure goes way down and they don't squish so many cherries. Okay. So again, just a beautiful demonstration of what can happen by providing that kind of feedback. All right. So how do we get from these beautiful demonstrations on the tactile side to proprioception? The ability to know where your limb is. And here we have a problem. And the problem is that although the somatosensory, somatosensory homunculus does give a pretty good overview of these kind of coarse body parts, and is actually pretty good for digits, it's not very good for proprioception. So um, in a, in the, there are all these classic experiments from Penfield and others, neurosurgeons, who stimulate somatosensory cortex and ask people what they feel. And very rarely was the percept, oh, I feel my limb moving. Okay, they felt tingling and touch and these sorts of things, but rarely did they feel their limb moving. And th there's at least one example already by, uh, forgetting the surgeon's name now, um, where he did find a couple sites, um, and that he was way deep in the medial wall of the brain, and he, and he only found two such sites out of like 30 or 50 that he looked at. So there isn't a lot, there's sort of not this, this obvious documentation of proprioceptive sites where you know if you stimulate you're going to get sense of motion that's there for, for the taking. And in any case, if you record, so that, that's stimulating, if you record neural activity as monkeys move the limbs around, what you find is that there are lots of neurons that respond to movement that are clearly proprioceptive, but nearby neurons may have very different response properties. And so that means that there's a violation of that topography. And the problem is, as we were talking about earlier, when I drive current into neural tissue, I, I can't pick which neuron I'm going to excite. I'm going to excite all the local neurons. And so if the local neurons aren't doing similar things, and I excite all of them, you're going to get a muddied percept. It's going to be hard to get a crisp biomimetic activation pattern, because those nearby neurons wouldn't normally be firing together. Does that make sense? So that's the problem that we're faced. And then, you know, even if we did know the right spiking patterns, as I just said, we can't really recreate them with stimulation. And in any case, in patients, if you've got a deafferented patient, you can't do that experiment of moving the limb around and recording all those fine things. If you know that you have a nice topography of the hand, then you, can, you know where it should be, and you start poking around, and people tell you where they feel it, and it works, because you can pretty quickly map that out in a patient, but it doesn't work so well uh, in this case if you, don't, if you don't know what the topography looks like. All right, so um, how are we going to solve this problem? So we're going to take a different approach. We're going to look at learning um, instead of trying to create biomimetic. So instead of trying to recreate natural biomimetic patterns, we're going to try to recreate natural learning. And unfortunately, I'm running a little short on time, so let me think about, let me, let me just tell you something about learning, okay? So think about if you have two cues. So I've been telling you a lot about your ability to know where your limb is. And I, I can see my limb, and I can feel my limb, right? And even with a robotic limb through BMI, you can, you can still see the thing, but you can't feel it. So in normal intact people, for you, what happens if, for some reason, vision and proprioception disagree? And you can do this in the lab with things like prism glasses, so that the whole world is shifted. So I see my hand over here, but it really is here. What happens in that case? Well, what happens is that, well, you average them. So, for example, if my vision is here, my proprioception is here, and I ask you, you know, what, what's the right answer? What would be the right thing to do? Maybe the right thing to do is to say, I'm just going to average the two. So if I gave you two measurements of something, and I asked you what's the true answer, you'd say, I don't know. i say, well, give me your best guess. You'd say, I'd average them. Right? That seems like a reasonable thing to do. And the brain sort of does that, okay? So if I have vision, I proprioception, the brain averages them. Except it does something slightly smarter than that. Imagine that you knew that proprioception was not as good of a sensory modality. So if I close my eyes and you ask me to point to my other hand, I can do it, but I, I miss more. But now if I can see my other hand, it's easy and I can point more accurately. Okay? So that would say that vision is sort of, th this cloud is meant to represent the uncertainty associated with vision. Let's say it's better. Well, you might think then the answer is then just rely on vision. But actually that's not the right answer. The best thing you can do is to still average them, just to weight vision more. And conversely, if vision is um, less reliable, then you should weight proprioception more. 
And this can be written down in terms of an uh, optimization problem. And you can think of the optimization problem as either a minimum variance problem or a maximum likelihood problem. And um, the solution is something like this. If you know you have two sensors, and you know they each have some uncertainty, which we can express as a variance, sigma visual or sigma per perception, then the right thing to do is to average these two, but to average them inversely proportional to their variance. So this is a little hard to read, I apologize, but what this says is that the weighting on vision, on your estimate from vision, is proportional to one over the visual variance, and this is one over the proprioceptive variance. So the more variable you are for a given modality, the less you weight that modality. And what that does is it gives you an integrated variance that's written like this, and this is one over each of these things, and then the inverse of that. So you take the inverse, sum them, take the inverse of that. And um, some of you may already have the mathematical intuition, but it's true that this thing is always smaller than either, this is always smaller than either of these. So the point is that by averaging these two, even if one's more noisy, by averaging them with this weighted answer, you always get an answer that's minimally variant. So it's a good thing to do this, right? Um, and by the way, this is part of the Kalman filter. So when the Kalman filter takes in multiple sensors and combines it with an internal um, estimate of things, th th you know, so we th when you think about the Kalman filter, you think about it as averaging sensory feedback and internal estimate, right? You guys learned about that, right? That's, that's like, if you were thinking about anything in the Kalman filter, what does it do? Oh, it averages sensory feedback and an internal predictive estimate, right? Yep, I know you're all nodding inside. Um, but if you have more than one sensor, it's also asking how do you, how do you weight those sensors together. And this is the solution that the common filter has built into it. All right. <coughs> All right. This is buried in the common game. Exactly. Um, okay. So, okay. So this is what people do. Now, if there's a persistent disagreement between two sensory modalities, the brain is also very plastic and it'll bring those two things back into alignment. And I want to point out now, just to be clear, this is not some weird experiment we do in the lab with prisms. This is the normal state. Sensory signals are inherently noisy in the brain. Two sensory signals never tell the brain exactly the same thing. And so the brain's always weighting these two things together. And not only that, um, it's a hard job because the natural sensory signals that come in are complex, they're heterogeneous, they're mixed up and stuff. And so the brain has to figure out how to combine these. And, um, and, in, and in fact, it has to be learned. So due to, due to time, what I'm going to do is to tell you about the next set of slides, and I'm going to cut to the chase. Um, so we asked how it is that this could be learned. How could you learn to combine two sensory signals? And we did a bunch of neural network modeling, which is all deeply interesting. But the bottom line is this. It turns out that you can get a neural network to learn to take two sensory signals and keep them in tune with each other, and to combine them in the statistically optimal way. And all you need to make that work is that the two signals coming in are representing the same thing, that they're correlated moment by moment. It's kind of a beautiful thing. Something called unsupervised learning, meaning you don't know anything about what you're supposed to do, you're just making sense of the data. That will do this optimal cue combination and it will keep them calibrated if they go out of alignment. And not only that, if you start out with two sensory cues that you don't know anything about, this network will learn to combine them. And by the way, as a side note, it can, we've pushed that idea more and it can do all kinds, that same algorithm can do all kinds of things like even implement a common filter if you set up the statistics right. That's a side note. Okay, so again, the, the, the take home from this is, according to our model, it's just a model that we built, it's a neural network model using some machine learning tools. If two signals correlate moment by moment, our network can learn to integrate them. Well, what about the brain? Can the brain do that? So here's the idea. If signal correlation is enough to drive integration of two signals, in other words, if two signals are always telling you about the same thing, you'll figure it out, the brain will figure it out. Could we use this to develop a learning-based approach, harnessing this natural ability to bring signals together, to make sense of them, um, with artificial feedback? So here's the experiment. We're gonna create spatial temporal patterns of activity in the brain with, by stimulating S1, just like Sleeman did uh, for that, that, that tactile experiment that I told you about with the monkey except we're gonna create patterns that the monkey's never experienced before. Emphatically non-biomimetic, just as a proof of concept. We're gonna use random crazy patterns the monkey's never experienced. But here's the thing, they're gonna correlate moment by moment with vision. They're gonna tell the monkey the same thing that vision's telling him. So how do we do that? 
So we train a monkey to do kind of a weird task. He's going to be just doing kind of a typical center outreaching task. Move, move, move. The kinds of things that these boring tasks that motor physiologists do. Except he can't see the target. Instead, what he's going to see is a bunch of random dots. And those random dots are going to be moving coherently in some direction. And if the random dots are moving off in this direction, just imagine like a twinkling star field, like you know, the, the opening credits of Star Wars. But if they're moving off in this direction, that means you need to move in this direction. And if they're moving fast, it means you're far away from the target. And if they're moving slow, it means you're close to the target. And um, the monkeys can learn readily to do this task. It's actually straightforward. And one of the reasons that we use this kind of weird setup is that it, it gives us a very easy lever to change the reliability. Remember that when I was talking about Q combination, the spread of those little colored circles. We can change that reliability readily by changing the number of dots that move in this coherent direction. So if I want the monkey to move off in this direction, I can make all the dots move that way, or 50%, or even 0%, which means he's actually not getting any information at all. So I'm going to give him these, these feedback signals, and I can control how reliable it is. And I'm going to do this online, full time. So as he's moving, if he makes a mistake, this, this flow field updates with him. And you'll see what that looks like. So we train the monkey to do that. And then we start playing this weird pattern of stimulation, which I'll show you. It's non-biomimetic. But it correlates. It gives the same information that this visual cue is giving. And the question is, Will they learn it? All right, so this is what it looks like. Oops. Here's um, the monkey doing the task during training. So he's gonna, he goes to the starting point. Now there's this weird dot field. He can't see that target, but it's there. And he reaches. And what you can see is that those dots are moving, telling him where he needs to move. They're kind of moving off in this direction right now. He starts to move in that direction. And then see how they change. And they tell him, oh, you're a little bit off. And then he corrects. So it's kind of a weird task, but he gets good at it, zeroing out that flow. He can't see that circle, but he gets to the target quite effectively. So he's learned to do that. And then we just start playing this weird pattern of stimulation in his brain. And that pattern maps moment by moment with the visual feedback. So he's supposed to move in this direction. So these electrodes are pulsing the fastest. And he overshoots a little bit. So now these guys are pulsing the fastest and so on. Right? And he does this for a long time. It takes weeks, but he does this for weeks. Now, when we first do this, his performance actually is worse when we start tingling his brain than when he just has vision. Presumably because it feels annoying and he doesn't know what it is and it's weird. And then very quickly, after about a day or two, it's as if he's ignoring this. It doesn't matter at all. You get the same performance with or without the stimulation. He's, he's relying on vision. And he could have stayed that way. That would have been fine. It would have kept getting his juice and everything would have been happy. But the idea is that the brain can't help but pick out these correlations and learn to integrate them. And so over time, what happened was performance got better and better and better with respect to just vision alone when we added this stimulation. Until ultimately, he was able to do this. Here he's moving, and he doesn't see anything. He's sitting in a dark room, but here he is making this movement. And he's doing that just driven by the sense of a feeling of where that target is with respect to him. Right? Now, I've got a bunch of slides here that sort of walk you through proof that he's combining these things in a statistically optimal way, the way I've told you that we combine natural cues. But I'm going to skip that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'll tell you a couple things, and then I want to get to just some thought for the future. I'm going to just summarize what we did. So we, we started with an arbitrary mapping of variables of interest to tickling the brain, to stimulating the brain. Um, and we think that the learning was driven by this correlation between vision and that weird pattern. And what ended up was this very natural sense of feedback that the monkey was able to reach with and that he combines with vision in this natural way. And importantly, I think this, uh, this whole idea came out of thinking about the computation, about thinking about the basic neuroscience principles of how it is that the brain is able to do these sorts of things. So it's biomimetic in a way, but biomimetic, again, about computation and learning, not about stimulation. And this was you know, a, a benchmark now. This is the first demonstration of multi-channel, continuous, two-dimensional, real-time feedback being used for control. Now, this isn't actually BMI. Okay, so now here's where I want to... This, this is this kind of weird task where the monkey's reaching and this flow. It's kind of a weird task. But you can imagine that it ports readily to BMI. And we're doing this now in the lab. So we have a monkey who is sitting there, and he's uh, controlling a cursor, just like uh, happens in Krishna's lab. With, with motor cord. In fact, we're using the algorithms that Krishna developed. So he's controlling this cursor as it moves around the screen. 
and then we're stimulating in his brain so that it's mapping exactly to what he's seeing through a pattern though that he's never experienced before. And we were making very good progress. We were just starting to see improvement with performance when the array died. Okay, this, is, this is the problem with the current technology for interfacing with the brain. It's not very good and they fail. And so uh, that experiment was aborted, but uh, day after tomorrow we're re-implanting new electrodes and hopefully we'll pick it up again. And hopefully I'll be able to tell you soon that this idea ports very well to this very literal application now of making a monkey be able to feel a cursor moving around the screen. That's where we want to get to. Now, one of the things I just want to briefly mention is this notion about peripheral versus brain interfaces. Um, obviously, if, you have, if you're trying to control an external device and you're completely paralyzed and you have no somatic sensation, you got to go to the brain. Um, I would argue that even in the case of amputees, once we solve these brain interface problems, it might make sense. It might be that you want to go to the brain because it's easier to tr put lots of information in. There's sort of more tissue there to stimulate. And then one last thing before we're done, this distinction that I've been drawing between biomimicry. So I said what you really want to do is you want a cochlear implant that, that you know, mimics what it is that, um, uh, that naturally happens. But in fact, even the cochlear implant isn't truly biomimetic. And in fact, it takes a lot of rehabilitation to learn to hear with a cochlear implant. And so there's, there's sort of a continuum between biomimicry and learning. And in fact, the, the real solution is going to be somewhere in between. And the debate, I think, is how much effort do we need to put into mapping out what natural patterns look like before we try doing this? And how much can we just use the best we've got and then rely on learning? And that's still sort of a debate in the literature. I'll stop there. For those of you that do need to peel off, we're at 10.20, but otherwise, I think maybe we have five minutes. Uh, I we'll can stay as long as you guys. I apologize for not leaving too many times at the end for questions. But. So I know how you work. You save your questions until somebody <laughs> asks a question, then it you know, sucks. So <laughs> somebody dies. So to what extent is this um, exactly used in the field? And if I'm happy to go hard, if I'm good. With my arm. Can I get one of these myself? No, so I mean, this is very much still uh, at, at the stage of thinking about. Now, the peripheral interfaces stimulating the peripheral nerve for tactile feedback, um, that is, is further along. There, there are a number of sites with clinical trials, um, but pre, pre, pre clinical um, human trials. Uh, but that's something that I think will be available, you know, in, I don't know, maybe the 10 year time frame. Um, or, or even maybe a little bit faster than that. But uh, you know, this idea of being able to stimulate the brain, in fact, we were joking about this earlier that I had submitted a grant, and one of the comments I got is, why are you messing around with monkeys? Why don't you do this in human? Yeah. Um, but, but the thing is, and it's a valid question, but here's the thing. We want to go in and we want to stimulate the brain in a way that no one's ever done, intentionally changing the brain. Right? We're driving reorganization of the way the brain processes this information. We've, no one's ever done that before intentionally over long periods of time. I really think you need to try this out in a monkey first and make sure it works, make sure it's safe. I, I think it will be safe. I don't see any obvious reason why. Uh, you know, I don't know that you would want this if you were using that tissue for something else. But if you're paralyzed and you're not using that somatosensory tissue for anything else anyway, it seems like a perfectly good use for it. Um, but there's still a lot of work to get this to the point where we can even do a preliminary human trial, I would say probably you know, at least four years, um, you know, on kind of a small scale trial, and then ramping it up to really getting it out there, putting it in a commercial device. Well, there are no commercial devices yet anyway for these sorts of things, even on the motor side. So it's going to be a while. But, but, but you know, I think that these ideas are out there. And I, I would be very, you know, when the first commercial devices come out for, for prosthetic control of a limb, I think it's very likely they will have at least the tactile part in them. week. But, but, but to get to that real kind of asymptotic performance took about two months. That's a really long learning curve. Now, um, I, I think that there are lots of ways to improve that learning curve. This was like the first experiment ever, okay? And so one way is just to improve the way that we train the animal, and we've got some ideas about that. Um, actually, that Collinger study that I showed you, I think is a, is a fantastic example of how good training makes a big difference. That paper uses basically linear regression for decode. 
you know, it doesn't use any of the very clever tricks that Krishna and his colleagues have developed. Um, so it's not state of the art. Yet, they got, you know, what I think is fair to say state of the art performance, and they did it through clever training, letting the brain do the hard work instead of your brains doing the hard work. Um, and so there's some, certainly something to be said there. But, you know, there are three things to think about. There's out of the box, how well does it perform? You'd like to get that good because that gets people involved. You want fast learning and you want great asymptotic performance. It's very clear that the more biomimetic you are, the better this is going to be, right? If you start out with something you've never experienced, out of the box performance is going to be bad. Um, what isn't clear is how much it affects learning rate and asymptotic performance. I suspect that it will have a big influence on learning rate. I think the more biomimetic you are, the faster you'll learn. I don't know about asymptotic performance. We'll see what the um, study, you know what study section is? That's the people who review grants at the NH. I ask, I'm asking them the same question. We'll see if they think that's an interesting question. Um, just curious. So you're using vision and um, proprioception, artificial stimulation. Is there a way to condition other senses as well so as to boost like correlation? So for example, conditioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question too. And, and I think... Um,